Bring your tithes and bring your shame. Bring your guilt and bring your pain. Don't you know that's not your name? You will always be much more to me. Every day I wrestle with the voices that keep telling me I'm not right. That's all right. Amen. He is greater. God is greater than anything in this world. Amen? Amen. Glad you're here today. Welcome to First Christian Church. If you're a first-time guest, we're so glad to have you at First Christian. I know we got fall breakers going away from here and fall breakers coming to here. So if you're one of those travelers, uh, glad to have you today. We have a brand new series that is just starting today. So you picked a great day to come to First Christian Church. As you can see behind me, these beautiful, beautiful stained uh, posters are not glass, but they're stained posters look great. And the triptychs tell the stories of uh, lots of great things in the Bible. And those were designed by our guys here at First Christian Church, so give them a round of applause. I already heard several people saying those are beautiful coming in the doors, so we really appreciate the hard work goes into artistic stuff like that. And uh, they are talking about Second Church of Antioch, as you see on that middle poster there. You know, lots of the greatest things about church, the Christian church, 
were first demonstrated by the church of Antioch that we read about in the book of Acts. And so this series, we're going to be learning about what it's like, what does it mean for us to live as that kind of church. We're going to be the second church of Antioch, so that's what that's all about. We're glad you're here to listen to those words with us. Let's stand up together as we invite you to worship God. He is a strong God. Sing with Sarah this morning.
faithful to us. Be seated, please. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. It's a beautiful day to worship our Lord in song. Today, the worship team has asked me to select a hymn that we would all sing in these five services that we have today. My favorite is, How Great Thou Art. We learn about this awesome, wonderful God who has created everything that we see and even the things we don't see. I like to have my students go out and sit in the grass and just listen to the grass grow and see how God has worked. He is so great in the universe, in the stars, in the sky, the moon, the sun. We know he is always with us, and he goes with us wherever we go. Join with me in singing this song. I believe you can worship God in a great way by knowing how great God is. Sing these powerful words with us. How great thou art. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made, I see the stars, I feel the holy thunder, thy power throughout the
is great. God is love. He loves us. And through that love, he lifts us up. Sing with us.
In a moment, we'll have the opportunity to give our offerings as part of our worship. And as you prepare for that, I encourage you to pull out the connection card that was mentioned earlier. Uh, please fill it out, including your RSVP to this week's Wednesday night feast. And you can drop it in the offering plate as it's passed in just a bit. However, if you're a visitor with us, you can hold on to that card and take it downstairs to the Connections kiosk in the atrium where we've got a gift for you to say thank you for being with us today. And as we come to this time of offering, it's important to rem remember that if you are a guest with us today, please don't feel any pressure to give here at First Christian. You can participate if you'd like, but offering is simply a way for those of us who call First Christian our home to give as an act of worship and thanksgiving and not one out of obligation. If you would, please pray with me over the offering. Gracious Father, we are a grateful people thankful for the opportunity to worship you in song, word, and action. We ask that you receive our tithes and offerings, small portions of the blessings you've given to us, and use them to further your kingdom. We love you, Lord, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have just a few announcements for this morning, so feel free to follow along in your bulletin. First, middle schoolers, your fall retreat is October 13th through the 15th. It's coming up soon. And this is going to be a really fun weekend away at Camp ACC. So get excited and get registered um, online ASAP. And I know it's only October 1st, but we're beginning the prep uh, to prep boxes for Operation Christmas Child. And preparing boxes now will give them plenty of time to get around the world to those children who are in desperate need of the items that those boxes will carry. And so this Wednesday, we're having a box party to assemble a thousand boxes so that next Sunday you can grab a box, fill it up, and bring it back on November the 12th. So if you're around this Wednesday, around the church, feel free to drop by and lend a hand. And finally, the worship ministry is looking for more people to help lead our weekend worship. If you're interested in learning more about the tech and production that makes our services happen, or you've got a knack for playing an instrument or singing, uh, you can contact the email address worship at fcc-jc.org, and someone from the worship ministry will be thrilled to talk with you about your next steps. Or you can just say hi to Mike um, or, or, or Isaac or one of our production team staff, and they'd be happy to get you connected. And as always, be, for, be sure to check out your bulletin for more information and announcements like the upcoming kids' events and our Wednesday night groups. This morning as we gather around uh, this table, the Lord's table, to take communion together, I want us to sing these words before uh, uh, this, these words are spoken to us. Let's sing it together. All of you, God, is more than enough for all of us. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. We come to this time of communion, the Lord's Supper, to remember Jesus. He is the one who lived and died for us, the one who never changes. He is the one we live for. The world around us changes every day radically. Social structures are crumbling and changing. The world is rocked by natural disasters. The form of how we worship changes. We change. However, this one thing remains and never changes. That is the God we worship. Jesus 
also known as Emmanuel, meaning God with us, is the same from the far reaches of distant eternity to today and on forever. He never changes. He is our rock. He is the basis of our faith. He and only he saves us. He came and lived among us as one of us, full Fully human, he walked this dusty earth with us. He suffered on the cross and died for us. He rose from the dead to conquer death once and for all for us. Remember him now, the founder and the foundation of our faith. As we take this small little piece of bread, we remember the body of Jesus who lived as one of us right here on earth. As we take this small little cup of juice, we remember the blood shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus, never changing, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come before you as your children, forgiven and blessed by the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. This fact never changes. It is always the same. We remember Jesus, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Help us to be his faithful followers, for it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
morning, church. It is great to be with you. My name is Ethan Magnus. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a guest with us today, you are in the right place. We're glad you're here. Kicking off a brand new series today. It is called The Second Church of Antioch. Uh, th- this series is about, really, the first church of Antioch. Uh, the church of Antioch was a church uh, in the ancient world, one of the very first churches founded after the beginning of the church. But it's recognizing that a lot of things that happened in that first church of Antioch are things we want to happen in our church today. In fact, there are a lot of things that happened for the very first time at Antioch that have become permanent parts of who God's people are and how God's people live together. And so what we're doing in this series is looking at that first church of Antioch to see how we today can be the second church of Antioch. Now, to catch you up in the story here, uh, we've, we know about the Church of Antioch from the book of Acts. This is one of the books of the Bible. Uh, Acts is the book that tells us the history of the early church from just after Jesus' resurrection through the expansion across the Roman Empire. Uh, The book of Acts starts just after Jesus has risen from the dead. It describes some of the time that Jesus spent with his disciples teaching them. Uh, Let's see, it it talks about how he ascended into heaven but told them the Holy Spirit would be coming to give them power to lead the church. It talks about how when the Holy Spirit came, they preached boldly at the Jewish celebration of Pentecost. And on Pentecost, uh, thousands of people believed that Christ, in fact, was the Messiah, that he was risen from the dead, and that they could repent and turn to him, be freed from their sins, and be united with God through the work of Christ. And from there, the church just expanded, and the Jerusalem church grew 3,000 and then 5,000. But as the church in Jerusalem grew, this began to frustrate the local leadership, and soon a persecution broke out throughout the city of Jerusalem. And this persecution scattered the Christians. And it was, though, this scattering persecution that led to the first phase of mission in the church. Because as the Christians were driven out of Jerusalem, they went to other towns and there began to teach about Christ and the church began to spread. And this is how the church in Antioch was founded. We read about the church in Antioch beginning in chapter 11 of the book of Acts. We'll pick it up in verse 19. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and he saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad. He encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas, he went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. We may call ourselves First Christian Church of Johnson City, but they were truly the first Christian church. The first time the word had ever been used. And what we're going to discover over the next few weeks is that there are lots of firsts that happen in this church. Firsts that we want to pay attention to so that we can make sure we're seconds and we keep that spirit alive. But I want to start with this first, the simplest of firsts. They were the first ones to be called Christians. It's a curious little thing to happen first to them. A few things worth noticing. Number one, it's worth noticing that they did not call themselves Christians. If you go back and read the book of Acts, when they needed to name themselves, they called themselves the way. That was the name the church had given to itself, which is a really cool name, isn't it? Like, yeah, we're the way. And that's because Jesus said, you know, the way, the truth, and the life, follow me. They called themselves the way. That was cool. But when the world needed a name for them, they called them Christians. Now, there's a reason that the people of Antioch needed a name for this religious phenomenon. 
because they could not figure out what to do with this new religious movement that was happening in their midst. They hadn't seen anything like it before. In fact, this was true throughout the Roman Empire, that the Roman world was very puzzled by Christianity. Now, now, to be clear, I don't mean they were puzzled by new religions in general. No, they were very, very, they lived in a very religiously pluralistic society. Everybody you meet worshipped a different god or worshipped in a different way or was part of some different religious group, especially in a town like Antioch. Antioch was a very cosmopolitan, international city. It was at the intersection of two major trade routes. So people from all over the world had made their way to Antioch. So for a new religion to show up in Antioch was no big deal. But this religion was confusing to them. You see, most of the religions of the ancient world, the vast majority of them, were religions of appeasement. By that I mean they were designed to appease the gods, to make the gods a little less unhappy and a little more happy so that the gods would be nice to people. Think about how Greek religions worked or how uh, ancient Egyptian religion worked or how Norse religion worked or how Babylonian religion worked or how Canaanite religion worked. You've got some angry god up there and you build a temple in the center of town and you hire a priest to keep the god happy so the god will bless your city. Most religions in the ancient world were these kinds of religions of appeasement. But if you tried to talk to a Christian about appeasement, they would just say, oh, well, Jesus Christ took care of all that for us, so we don't have to worry about that. Well, so maybe they weren't a religion of appeasement. There was another category of religion in the ancient world. These were religions of morality. These got their start by great moral teachers thinking about how should we live? What are the right rules for life? The Stoics and the Epicureans were great moral religious movements. But if you tried to talk to a Christian about morality, they would just say, oh, we just imitate Jesus. That's our, we just act like Jesus. Yeah, he took care of the rule part. The law doesn't apply to us anymore. We just imitate Jesus. So you couldn't talk to them about morality either. Well, there, were a, there was a small other group of religions in the ancient uh, Greek and Roman world that were religions of philosophy. These religious people specifically said, what you believe, I mean, what you do doesn't matter. And how you worship doesn't matter. All that matters is what you believe. So the hedonists were like this. Some Platonists were like this. And there were other philosophical religious movements. But if you tried to talk to a Christian about philosophy, they would just say, well, we think those are interesting questions, but the height of all wisdom is Jesus. And so we just try to think like Jesus. We, 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 we just try to have the same mind as Jesus. Can you imagine how frustrating that was for the people of Antioch? It didn't matter what you tried to talk to these new people about. All they would ever talk about is Jesus. If I wasn't worried that you wouldn't get the joke, I would say, Jesus Christ. Anyways, you know, how frustrating that would be, right? That's all they would talk about. So they came up with a name to mock the people who would only talk about Christ and who only lived like Christ. They called them the little Jesuses. That's what Christian means. It means a Christette, a mini Christ. They called them Christians. And here's the thing. The mockers who said, these people have reduced the great questions of our religious world to just a one-word answer. These people, they were right. The early church had reduced the, the great moral questions of the day to the one name, Jesus Christ. And of course, they did this because this is what Jesus taught them to do. He says, you, follow me. That's your new whole moral theory. He was washing feet one time before the, um, the Last Supper. He washed their feet. As he finished washing their feet, uh, he, he put his outer garment back on and he got, went and sat back down. And then he said, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and that's exactly what I am. So if I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you. You should do what I have done for you. He says, listen, I'm telling you, no servant is greater than his master. No messenger is greater than the one who sent them. Now you know these things. You'll be blessed if you do them. 
He's saying, the imitation of me is the foundation of your moral world. He goes on in the same conversation, just a few verses later in that same chapter, John 13. He says, listen, I got a brand new command for you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is how everybody will know you're my disciples if you love one another. As I have loved you, you love one another. Just copy me. This was the invitation of Jesus. This was the way, they called themselves the way, the way of life to which they were invited was the way of follow me, be like me, do what I do, be a mini me. In the words of the Antiochene mockers, he said, be a Christian, a little Christ in my place. And this, this laser focus on Jesus Christ was how the people in Antioch got a new name. And it stayed one of the marks of the early church. I mean, think for a minute how easy it would have been for them to try to fit in with the religious world of their day, right? They could have become a religion of appeasement, Preaching everywhere, if you go to church enough and take communion enough and read your Bible enough and pray enough, then God will like you enough and God will bless you. They could have become a religion of appeasement like most of the ancient religions. But they just kept saying, no, Jesus is enough. They could have become a religion of morality. Here are the rules, the things we must do right. Here are the don'ts, the things you can't do wrong. And just do a bunch of the right things and not a bunch of the wrong things and then somehow you'll measure up, right? But they kept saying, no, no, Jesus took care of that. Just imitate Jesus. Just act like Jesus. Just act like Jesus. They could have become a religion of philosophy. There's plenty of philosophy piled into the Christian faith. They could have sat back and sipped their lattes and debated truth till they fell asleep in their chairs. The opportunity was there for them, but they kept on saying, the truest thing I know is Jesus Christ and him resurrected. Paul kept saying, I committed to preach nothing but Jesus Christ. That was his commitment to not let this become a religion of philosophy they could it would have been so easy for that to happen to the church for them to become a religion of morality or a religion of appeasement or a religion of philosophical speculation but they stayed laser focused on the person of Christ this wasn't just the church in Antioch it just stays the normal way to be the church Paul is writing to the church in Corinth they've written him about all these moral questions. They had written him a letter with hard questions. And he writes back and he's answering them one by one. He says, okay, concerning that thing you wrote about. And then in the middle of this long, complicated moral argument, he says, listen, here's the bottom line. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. As some translations render that, you imitate me as I imitate Christ. He says, that's, that's the short version of every moral quandary we're going to face. What do we think Christ would do? Let's be the many Jesuses that he called us to be. Even the Christian writers most prone to philosophy know that the heart of our faith is not a philosophy, but it's a decision we make about the person of Christ. I love the way 1 John writes... And he loved philosophical language. He clearly was well-trained in Greek philosophy, but he knows that it all comes down to Jesus. Listen to this text. He says, we know that we have come to know him. How do you know that you know? You know that you know if you keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. The truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we're in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. The, the, the mark, the, the identifying trait that we are one of Christ's people is our growing imitation of Christ's person. You know, I think about how important it is that we never forget that Christianity is meant to be a lived-out faith. 
The tension between doctrine and life, I'm convinced, is invented by our spiritual adversary, Satan himself, to distract us. Because Christ, Christ found no tension between that. Our lived out faith and our life of believed faith were all wrapped up into the one person of Christ. It is Christ that we believe in, therefore it is Christ that we imitate. But I think about how often in my life I am tempted to reduce my faith to a doctrinal checklist. And if I check all the right boxes and believe all the right things, and if what's going on in my head meets the standard that I decided on, then somehow I'm in, and I'm good. And if, we and I, if you and I debate, and your checklist is a little different than my checklist, well, if they're a little different, then you're still a Christian. You're just the wrong kind of Christian. But if they're too different, I'm not even sure about you anymore. And Jesus says, trust in me. Believe in me. Imitate me. If Jesus weren't the truly incarnate Son of God, died and resurrected for our sakes, he would be the most self-absorbed human being that ever walked the planet. Because he keeps saying it's about me. The answer to your great philosophical questions is Jesus. The answer to your great moral questions is Jesus. The answer to your relationship with God questions is Jesus. And this was what the people of Antioch recognized in this young church and did not know what to do with. They'd never seen a group of people who thought every question in the universe could be answered with one man's name. So they called them Christians. I love what Paul writes to the church in Colossians. It's just, it drips so deeply with the majesty and centrality of Christ. If you, want some to, if you want to somehow spend some more time in this theme about why you would call it, why we get called Christians and not some other name, go read Colossians. It just drips with the majesty and centrality of Jesus Christ. Listen to this one little bit. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If anybody has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Do you see that? There it is, the call to imitate Jesus. Paul can't write four sentences about morality without reminding us of the great love of Jesus Christ. Over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then he does this this masterful treatment. These next verses, they just are overflowing with the centrality of Christ. Listen to what he says. We're going to look at these for a second. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There's so much to notice about the text. First, notice it's in these three parts, and every part ends with a reminder to be grateful for Jesus Christ. We, we, just, we probably can't get reminded of that often enough, can we? To be grateful for Jesus Christ. That's what's the same about every part. But notice what's different. Because in each one of these sections, Paul is addressing the great religious questions of the ancient world, which are still the great religious questions of our heart, and he says the answer to every single one is Jesus. To the great question of, how can I be made right with God? How can the war that is happening between my soul and my creator God ever be settled? To that great question, he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace he says christ is the one who has brought peace where there was once war christ is the one who has brought reconciliation where there was once estrangement 
to the great religious question of how can we know what is true? How can we know what is wise? How can we settle the philosophical wonderings of the human heart? He says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your heart. Christ is the answer to the great philosophical questions of the world. And then he gets to the moral question. The last great question we ask about religion, how should we live? What does a flourishing human life look like? I want to know how to live my life. He says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Imitate Jesus. Act like Jesus. That's the answer, he says. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. No wonder they were called Christians. They thought Jesus Christ was the answer to every question you could ask. And that is why we're still called Christians. Because we think Jesus Christ is the answer to every question you could ask. That's who we are. We're the people who believe in Jesus and imitate Jesus and trust in Jesus. He's the one who's reconciled us to God. He's the one who is the cornerstone of all truth. He is the one who leads us in paths of righteousness. One of the things I love about this church, uh, we're from a movement of churches that um, does its best to take really seriously the centrality of Jesus, even in how we talk about ourselves. Uh, this movement of churches, when it was started, by started by people from a bunch of different denominations who decided they were tired of being Baptists and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Episcopalians, even though we love Baptists and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Episcopalians, we love them all, but they just decided we just want to call ourselves Christians because that's the name they called them in Antioch. So we're just going to call ourselves Christians. One of our slogans from way back in the day, it still marks this church, is we are not the only Christians. I mean, just look around this town. There's so many good churches in this town where God is being glorified and the Spirit of God is alive. We're not the only Christians. We know that. But we are Christians only, meaning all we have is Jesus and the truths that the Bible teaches about it. One of our slogans we've got is, um, no creed but Christ. What we mean by that is we don't have long doctrinal statements. We don't have a big published thing that if you disagree on one little thing, you're out. We say we're just going to center our faith on Jesus, on what he's done for us on the cross, the imitation of his life, and the belief in him. And that'll be the center of our moral theory. That'll be the center of our doctrine. That'll be the center of how we think you become a follower of Christ. It's about Jesus. He saves, not us. I like that about this church. We aren't the first church of Antioch, but we're trying really hard to be the second church of Antioch to be a church that's so laser-focused on Jesus Christ that people every once in a while think they need to make up a name for us. Many Jesuses, Christettes, the little Christs. Or maybe they'll use the one the people in Antioch made up. Christian. If you're here today, maybe maybe you've been kicking around church for a while and you've been wondering... You know, should you follow Christ? Or what would it mean to follow Christ? What would that even look like? I just want to remind you of a couple things it doesn't mean. See, because following Christ is not a philosophy, you can follow Christ and still have tons of questions. See, if it was a philosophy, you'd have to figure it out and make sure you agreed with it all before you decided to follow Christ. But since it's not a philosophy, you can say, I want to follow Christ with my life even though I don't have it all figured out. But I think he's the one who can teach it to me, so I'm going to go follow him. And if, if Christianity was a morality, well then before you could follow Christ, you'd have to make sure you'd figured out how to live right and live straight and keep all your ducks in a row. But it isn't a morality. So you can follow Christ and still do tons of stuff wrong. In fact, we all do. That's sort of the point. You could say, I want to follow Christ not because I do live like him, but because I want to live like him. 
and I'm going to trust him with my next step and my step after that. And when I take the wrong step, I'm going to trust him to call me on it and call me back to the right step. If it were a morality, you'd have to get it all right first, but it's not a morality. So you can start following Jesus even when you've got it all wrong. If Christianity were a way of earning God's favor, then you're right. Before you decided to follow Christ, you'd have to get a lot of ducks in a row. You'd have to make sure you came to church enough and read your Bible enough and took communion enough and believed all the right things and checked all the right boxes. But it's not. That's the thing the people of Antioch recognized. This thing that was happening in their midst was something they'd never seen before. It wasn't some new philosophy you had to understand. It wasn't some new morality you had to achieve. It wasn't some new way to earn God's favor you had to work up to. It was Jesus Christ. The truest thing. The best thing. And the reconciler of all people to him. So I would just say, if you're waiting until you've got it all figured out, or wait until your life looks right, or wait until you've pleased God enough, you will wait forever. But if you're just waiting till there's a savior who's ready to rescue you and lead you, then you don't need to wait any longer at all because that's Jesus. And that is who we are. Let us never forget, we are the people who follow Jesus, the people who imitate Jesus, the people who trust Jesus, Jesus, the people who center everything we do and everything we believe on the work, life, and teaching of Jesus Christ. And any time we try to add to what Jesus has done, we are in error. And any time we try to ignore some aspect of his life that we should be imitating, we are in error. Any time we make anything at all the center of our faith other than Jesus, we have fallen into error because we, just like the good people of Antioch named us, we are Christians. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, draw us nearer to Jesus Christ. Draw us nearer to Jesus Christ. Teach us to follow him, to become imitators after his life. Teach us to trust him that his salvation is sufficient to unite us to you and we cannot and need not earn it on our own, but Christ has done the work. Teach us to believe in him that all wisdom is found in Christ Jesus. Teach us to be the followers of Jesus Christ. That we would live up to the name the mockers gave us. That we would truly be Christians. We pray this in the name of the one, the center of all things, the center of our faith and this church, Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, let's stand and sing. We sing our commitment to Jesus. If you need someone to pray with you today, we've got a friend up here who'd love to pray with you. He'll be in front of the piano either during the song or after the service. Come up and find him. He'd love to pray with you. If today's the day you need to decide to follow Jesus, we'd be thrilled to take those steps with you as you're received by him and baptized into Christ. We'd love to do that with you. Or maybe you just need to, where you are, rededicate your life to making Jesus the only center of your faith. Let's sing together.
beyond all measure and compare. And right now we do, as Paul t- teaches us, give you thanks for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus who has reconciled to us to you. Thank you for Jesus who leads us as we imitate him. Thank you for Jesus who is the ultimate truth of the universe. As his ambassadors, we leave this place and in his name we pray. Amen. Church, have a great week. Go be a little Jesus. <laughs>